Thank you for being here. Um, a couple of thank yous go out. Uh, this exhibition, as you can see, is pretty complicated. Um, lots of technology, so it would not have happened without Marissa Pascucci, David Sackett, Clayton Van <laughs> Chris Kralovac, Isabel Hogenkamp, I don't know where Isabel is now, um, Over and, here. and the team at Mitchell <laughs> Innocent Nash in New York, Jacoby's Gallery, hey. uh, and lots of gallery interns that are kind of manning VR stations and, and have been helping a lot with the exhibition. Woo! Woo um, <laughs> would also not have been possible without the support of the Herb Jackson and Laura Roach Gallery Endowment, the Baca Foundation visiting artist lecture fund and um, Davidson College Friends of the Arts and of course the support of the art department. So thanks to all of those folks. Um, so we're just going to do a little chat here and I thought that maybe I would start by asking you a question um, and then maybe we'll turn to the audience soon. But most of the work in the exhibition, the four videos, two that loop across the hall, this piece, the video, the two channel piece here, and then the two VRs are part of the same series called Birds in Paradise. Um, and so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about Birds in Paradise. You mentioned today, or yesterday, that it was deeply personal, that there were things that felt sort of embarrassing about the project, um, that it was very raw. And so I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about the piece and the making of it, which, feels a bit like a posthumous work with your mother, yeah. Patricia. Mm -hmm. Is that a good start? Yes. Yeah. Well, Birds in Paradise. Uh, it's so great to have my family here, my dad and my aunt and my cousins and my brother. Uh, this is literally the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> They're literally the reasons in like the architecture that kind of formed this show actually. It shows so much about family and how I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina with like my dad and my mom and my brothers and my aunt, like being custodians of my like practice in a really magical and giving and nurturing way. And I basically like in my room and made drawings and I went to the governor's school and I learned about painting and I learned about myself and I had to negotiate and reflect on how am I going to like make sense of like <coughs> battling cancer and having a mother who was diagnosed with schizophrenia and having to go to the mental hospital and like oh wait I'm so sorry <laughs> and she and, and dealing with her catharsis, which is what made me an artist. Her catharsis was making drawings and sound pieces. And that's exactly how, and my dad would, was generous and kind and patient and would buy her the cassette tapes and the recorder and the crayons and the, the glitter crayons and markers. And as a kid, I wanted to use those materials with envy. And she said, baby, you gotta learn how to draw you're gonna use my expensive crayon. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would take my video game magazines and I would copy the drawings over and over and I would show her and my dad. And my dad thought I was tracing them and he was like, you actually drew that? And I was like, yes. And they started taking my practice seriously, and my mom would allow me to work. And she, we would make storybooks together, and like I was just so excited about her glitter crayons and all. <laughs> and, you know, I saw her like manifesting these magical, amazing body of drawings for like her whole life, and she was sending them off to the Home Shopping Network to get invented and all these paid programs. It never really manifested, but like eventually when her illness kind of metastasized into something bigger, the drawings came from a place of necessity and survival. Her mark to the paper was her way of like honing in on the voices in her head and neutralizing the chaos. It was medicinal. Every mark on the page was better than any kind of medicine. And I didn't realize the poetry in that until I had a nervous breakdown in college and with my identity as a black artist and like, you know, I'm not figuring, trying to figure out my place in the world. And 
my teachers trying to figure out what to do with me and trying to get me to subscribe to like a few black artists that were making it and because they didn't know how to deal with that and so I went back home one Christmas and I saw her making those drawings still and I saw those cassette tapes and I was like oh my gosh this is from survival and you should work from a place of necessity and I brought the drawings back and I had a better dialogue with them and I started using the drawings to actually become instructions for my actual visual art in a different way and eventually those instructions manifested one of the most beautiful lives I could ever imagine having coming from Columbia, South Carolina and you know <laughs> like she literally like wrote the blueprint for me to like have very colorful and you know, it was sort of like she wrote the roadmap to my journey to freedom. And so when the, and so I ended up abandoning painting for a while and tracing the drawings, constructing these Hermobashian Renaissance worlds. And I learned, I made Redefined Desire series and I made a whole you know, 60 minute film project and country ball. I mean, all these pieces that traveled the world and eventually after the Whitney Biennial, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art offered, said, offered me a two year commission to do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and we drank a bottle of wine. And I was like, <laughs> I, like, I wanna make a virtual reality album. I wanna make a pop album, my mom was so But it sounded ridiculous, it's like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and so for two years I used that budget. It was a budget for like, it was a good budget for me to live for two years and I, I split it in half with my friend Nick Weiss and he taught me everything about Ableton Live and Pro Tools and music production. And we, I took my mother's cassette tapes. She made 155 acapellas. <laughs> of our cousin Irvin, she was inspired by him making music, and she was like, I want to make pop hits too, that's money. So, <laughs> so she was writing these commercial jingles and singing, and I was so embarrassed as a kid because I would play video games with my friends, and she was like, bum, 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 ow, that's the shit, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God, that was so embarrassed. <laughs> That's okay, y'all laughing at me. Y'all gonna be my backup dancers one day. It's <laughs> okay, true. It's true. <laughs> so, I was like, my wife playing those songs, they sound like Michael Jackson and Earth, Wind, Fire, you're not writing original songs, whatever. And so like, the songs were, like, and it's so funny, she used her pencil as a metronome and they're like American folk songs and they're really original. And so when I, you know, I, when I digitized all the recordings, I, um, they became, it's, the, it's like the work is about, not about her, but the, she created the architecture for me to use. I, her lyrics and the drawings allowed me to make sense of the global zeitgeist and the pandemic and the politics and the race war. Like they're sort of, instru uh, like, sort of like how like surrealists used to do it in the 40s and 50s during World War II when painting was seen as propaganda, they started writing text and drawings as these prompts to get, to move towards the body and expression and to deal with absurdity into, you know, just a rejectionist narrative. And so like, I made sense of the world with these songs. I made this album. I got Kindness who, I got a lot of like real producers to like give me samples and loops. And I got my singers who were, I got the singers who were like the door girl of a club. And like, like Alyssa, you wanna sing on this track called Second Time Around and my mama's lyrics. And I, like, I, I will put like friends on the album and we end up making, you know, a really compelling album for two years. And I, while I was making the album, I was also going home with the demos and animating. Um, and I felt absent from my family because like I wasn't able to go home because the work, I made all this alone on my, by myself with no assistance, like these white artists who have blue chip colors. <laughs> I literally made it all by myself. And I compromised a lot of experiences and relationships and it was really absent, just like churning away, making the demos 
and the sound would influence the video. And then I go back to Nick and say, we need to find this synthesizer that sounds like, you know, a blue atmosphere because I did it in this animation. And I want this song, but this acapella that my mother made, I want to, you know, align it with this. And I, I curated 14 tracks. Um, from her 155 tracks that could weave together and make a storyline that manifested my life and what I'm interested in. And that's what Birds in Paradise is. I spent five years uh, from 2015 to 2020 making all six chapters. It's an hour and 30 minutes and um, it scores the whole film. And the film is really complex. I shot this in Mallorca, some is shot in China and the animation in some parts you see in Solange when I get home film. Like the thing about it is that when Solange and I met, uh, we worked together at the level when we finally met in LA, we were both in a similar place in our life, going towards black extraction and black expression, not black politics, but like how do you like to experience emotion through like harmony and narrative. And thinking, and we were like reflecting on the South, she grew up in Dallas and Houston, Texas, and I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, she wanted to talk about the rodeo. So this is like a rodeo, but it's a, a Roman Coliseum, but it's also 360 degrees, like a, a virtual reality experience. And I kind of like, you know, this piece was really inspired by her in my experience as But anyway, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started to touch on, the imagery is really complex. There's a yeah. lot happening. Mm -hmm. The shortest film is five and a half minutes. Yeah. The other ones are 18, 20, some of the VRs are 15 minutes. Yeah. Tell us some things to look for. Like we, I know that the gaming aesthetic is really strong, obviously. Um, there's video footage of you. Uh, in this particular piece, there's a reference to some African yeah. kind of rebirth ri rituals. Mm -hmm. What else should people look for? What, which, because there's so much. Well, Give us a few the seconds. African rebirth. So, our Robert Harris Thompson Flash of the Experience, the Flash of the Spirit was a big influence because at the time I was at the University of Pennsylvania studying with um, Terry Atkins and a whole kind of But Terry Atkins, I mean, you know, like at the time the conversation was like Neo Voodoo, William Cordova, et cetera. You know, like it was a lot of stuff that there was, it was, in, it was like, like bubbling, and I was really interested in African ritual. And but what I found to align and mirror my practice is that in Nigeria and the Yoruba and Gelade practice, that Africans for centuries would carry on a ritual to celebrate a queen mother identity, like a female feminine spirit, a queen mother. And they would all perform in a circular tribal ritual, um, a suite of performances that were interdisciplinary and they would build sculptures around it and all this stuff, and like as, and we went, as technology advanced, when they saw an airplane flying across the sky, that the airplane would enter the headdress, and it was sort of like the same way that my mother was making, obviously. So I felt there was like a conceptual mirroring of it, and so I decided to use those tropes of ritual from Africa in the piece when you see me getting shrouded, and when you like, like wrapped around like that, that's like a, shr a, a ritual, like, that's like a common ritual, like like shrouding is for like death and life and like rebirth and rehabilitation and spiritual cleansing and renewal. And when you see that black woman washing me in the water, that's sort of about like sobriety and renewal and like the, it's like the mommy water, the black female mermaid comes and takes me and then she, you know. So this piece is all about like that kind of restoration. Um, do you want to talk any about the imagery, the dancing? Um, in the moments of silence? Oh, well, then, <clears throat> so that's the opener for the piece. And the closing of the piece is the same space. I wanted to open the piece uh, and close the piece. I think I was using like nightlife space. Like Spectrum was a club in Brooklyn that a lot of like legendary performers started there. Like Juliana Huxtable started DJing there and started her party. Uh, Extra I forgot the name of that party. But like a lot of people, like a lot of us would incubate their our ideas. And my mom wrote this song called Moments of Silence. And I wanted, I wanted to use the nightlife, I don't know, that space, I don't even want to talk about it. That's unnecessary. <laughs> like, the whole point of that piece is 
What about finance? What? Well, just, I was thinking about in terms of like, you know, sometimes we worry about getting too deep into someone's identity when we talk about their artwork, but this work is so personal and it is about your identity. You told me earlier that you couldn't have made any of this work if you didn't grow up in the South, if you weren't black, if you weren't queer. Like, I just, and yeah. you feature yourself so prominently in the works. I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have made the work without all those attributes about myself, but like, I mean, that's kind of, I can't really say more than that, but I know that what I can say about the movement is that Bruce Nauman and Joseph Boyce and uh, Valley X, so a lot of modernist performance artists, and Teresa DeKeer's maker, Merce Cunningham, the ballroom scene a little bit, but not much, but the vernacular of that, the reason why people like aligning with the ballroom scene, because, you know, whatever it is, but the only thing that I have in common with that is that, like, I grew up around that kind of, of those identities, like, um, in high school and in my 20s, but, like, the thing that aligns is that my mother made a design house with utilitarian objects and songs, and I represented that design house, but what I do as a performance artist that made me such an interesting modernist dancer is that I mined the hammer and the lever and the pulley and I, on the ladders in her drawings on a green screen eight hours a day in Provincetown and in New York and in LA and the residencies and I developed the movement language through just abstract movement so I could make compelling compositions in the animation. So the movement that I do is just based on me doing like this, like this, which is all like miming how to use objects. And so like, and, but it also allows you to make compelling Renaissance looking images like angles and body movements. And I was thinking about my body as an object and that's why I say Bruce now and why I say uh, William Forsyth because in like the idea of the body as an object that makes angles and movements, that's not necessarily a narrative object, it's not necessarily a subjective object. That is, that is why the dance is what the dance is. That's what, it's like, it's not really, the identity is there, but it's really something else. And why spectrum? As a place for you. Oh, I just, I mean spectrum, because I feel like I sort of died and came back to life there. When in, I, that's I, what I'm getting at. Dying there. Yeah, I like to know. <laughs> at that club, I mean, all my friends would go to this club in Brooklyn that was like in a legal house. They shut it down, uh, but it was where we would go and disintegrate. Like it was sort of like we. I feel like at a time where I had a really hard period in my life, I like it was sort of like you know, I, I just re, I you know you know people share, people cry together and laugh together and incubate like. All intellectuals come together in nightlife and they're headless and they're drunk. <laughs> and they're like, you know. Freedom. They're free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they figure out how to be creative. Are there other questions? I want to hog it all. Do folks have questions? Yes. So, how long did it take you to, how long did it take you to produce what you feel is the finished product? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a great so, question. So like questions. each video is different. And also I've gotten more skilled in understanding my capacity and bandwidth and my tenacity is like, you know, it's all, it's, sometimes, you know, it's funny, some pieces took a year, some people, like a, a video can take a year, eight months, five months, three months. And like, it's so funny, it was sort of like, yeah, like I would say like, the whole series, this series, took from 2015 to 2020, November, 2015 to November 2020. And there's another piece that's not in the show, which I should probably circulate in the show, I don't know why I'm not doing that. Um, but like, yeah, uh, the final piece, which was really crazy, it, I was I was like manic, I was so excited. It took me like two weeks to finish the final piece in the series. <laughs> but it was because I was like really fat, and then after that, everything, you know, like, like my work, it's, 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 just, it's really labor intensive. And like how do I know when it's done? Just know. It's, just, it's through a lot of crying and crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day you're like, mm, it's done. <laughs> Thank you.
I, do you storyboard this stuff out or is it more intuitive like one thing leading to the next? So seat prints are how I storyboard it. So I try to, my, I'm a painter, I come from a painting background, painting is my number one medium and everything in this is a derivative of painting, the language of painting, the formalism, the design around that. So if I feel like an image like that or the Beth Ann Hardison image over there, if they can autonomously just exist as a painting, I make eight of those first and then I look at them and I weave them together. The video is the in-between spaces between each C-print. And I make sense of that narrative and I harmonize it. That's amazing. Yeah. And you are painting, actually painting again too. I know you yeah. use paintings, but do you want to talk about how those practices? So yeah, after I finished Birds in Paradise, I did a studio museum in Harlem residency during the, pen, the height of the lockdown. And I use it as an opportunity to you know, like move around. I, I moved into a different space and I started painting again to not only fix my body and my sciatica and my mind and my spirit, because the thing is I was losing a lot of my formalism because I was working digitally in front of screens, but mixing a palette and dealing with colors and my Joseph Albers principles and stuff that it helped strengthen, it helped strengthen my like sensibility. And so like, yeah, I paint to, you know, you meditate on an object and you move and you do this and it get a lot, you know, like the paintings at the MoMA PS1 Studio Museum show were an afterwards of the series where I did meditations on the concepts around the series, but distilled and but now ordinary mundane scenes that are more figurative and like in ordinary spaces, like scenes about addiction or scenes about like hedonism or scenes about like, um, you know, the, rebirth and ritual and like each painting kind of suspended the concepts that I was meditating on in the Birds in Paradise series through painting and that afterwards when in making those paintings it allowed me to t you breathe life back into myself and be a human because like it's very dangerous to stare at a screen that long like oh my god you know and so like when I moved into that place, painting downstairs and did, doing digital animation upstairs created this homeostasis between my practice that allowed me to do the Lincoln Center and my new piece, Refine Desire 7, and also move forward with the work I'm doing. At an unnamed, at an unnamed institution. institution. <laughs> <laughs> that you will definitely be hearing about. That you will hear about. But yeah, the painting is very important. If I don't paint, I can't make this. And this is painting. This is all painting. You can't, like, it's, why, how could that not be a reference to a Joseph Albers piece? But, like, also, that's a color theory moment. But it's also just the principle. It's just a formula. It's like, uh, you, otherwise, you have no other digital artist is going to think about the depth of fill and color and those hues and, like, making sure everything is uniform in that way if they're not principally aligned for painting. And if Katie is here, she knows how I was at governor <laughs> school. I was painting literally in my bathroom in my dorm, hot people. <laughs> it's a good place to end. Sure. <laughs> if there are other questions, do you want to um, take things more individually and people yeah. can enjoy looking at the rest of the show? Awesome. Good. good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.